it's great to be with you once again at Westkirk and to join together with you in worship this morning. I want to read as we start uh, a short call to worship from Psalm 96. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, all the world. Sing to the Lord and praise Him. Proclaim every day the good news that He has saved us. Proclaim His glory to the nations, His mighty deeds to all the peoples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank You today that we are able to come together, uh, that we're able to come uh, to worship you, and we pray that you would help us to do this in a way that would be pleasing to you, and we pray that you would help us to focus on your word as you speak to us in and through it, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that our time together would be a blessing to each one of us and would be to the honor and glory of your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing now our first hymn, uh, which is hymn number 496, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing your great Redeemer's praise.
and to share, I want to just share a little bit uh, about, uh, about some things that have happened to me in my own life uh, and how they've uh, been the way that God has touched my life. Um, I was just looking at the Bible uh, that I'm holding in my hand and thinking, when I was young, I decided I would enter a little competition. It was in a magazine uh, that the Scottish Bible Society produced, and I thought, oh, I'll try. I've never won anything ever, but I, I entered this little competition that they had, and you know what? I actually won a Bible very similar to this one, uh, and that was a wonderful prize to have, uh, something to treasure, really, because you know, a Bible isn't just a book. It's not just any old book, because it's got a message in here that is absolutely amazing. It's the amazing message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And, you know, when I was growing up, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I mean, I went to church, but I didn't really understand what that good news was. And it was when I was about 15, well, I was just shortly before I turned 16, uh, that, I, that I understood the message of the good news of Jesus Christ for the first time. And it comes from a story uh, that's told of uh, something that happened uh, way back in the early church, and it's recorded for us in the Bible. It's uh, re recorded for us in Acts 16. And Paul and Silas, who were servants of Jesus, they, they, they were apostles, people who went out to tell people about Jesus. They, they, they were put in prison. Now, I'm sure that none of us would like to be put in prison. Uh, and, and even if we were put in prison, it would be nothing compared to what prisons were like back then. Because prisons now, I mean, you can go into a prison and, you know, it's a bit sparse, but it's reasonably comfortable. Back in those days, it would have been absolutely stinking. They would have been tied up. They would have been in the dark. They would hardly have any food. It was absolutely awful. But do you know what? If you were in that situation, if you were tied up and in the middle of the night it was pitch black, you didn't know what was happening, what would you do? Any ideas what you might do? Would you sing hymns? <laughs> well, that's what they were doing. They were singing hymns and they were praying to God. And you know, God answered their prayers and all the doors in the prison opened. Sounds amazing, but that's what happened. And the guy who ran the prison, he thought, that's it. I'm, I'm a dead man because the Romans did not take kindly to their prisoners being let loose. And he thought, I'm just going to commit suicide. It was really horrible, a horrible situation. But Paul shouted out to the man not to harm himself. And he didn't. But he asked them straight away, what must I do to be saved? And you know what Paul's answer was? And this is what hit me when I was 15 years, years of age. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that's when I understood that the good news of Jesus was that simple. That being saved from our sin, being saved to be part of God's family, to be, be God's children. It was a really simple matter. Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. And that's how I came to faith. And it's a simple story, but it's anchored in this truth that faith in Jesus is the answer that we need in this world. And, and the hymn that we're going to sing now, uh, and thank you for listening so well, the hymn that we're going to sing now really speaks about someone coming to this kind of realization. It's hymn number 33, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? That's really understanding why Jesus died for us, and uh, speaks about coming to understand all of that. A really, really wonderful, wonderful hymn. Uh, and uh, I think the choir are quite happy to be singing it today from what I understand from them uh, and I hope that you'll uh, uh, enjoy singing it as well uh, as we think about 
uh, what we sing here. But verse 4 says this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, a light coming into their experience. Uh, I woke the dungeon flamed with light. We're just thinking about another prison, uh, but this is another story of someone who felt like they were in a prison, but when they understood who Jesus was for them, it was like everything lit up And when they came to understand that, that glorious good news of Jesus. So let's sing this hymn now, And Can It Be.
good to have a reading, uh, a slightly longer reading maybe than you're used to, but we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, which begins in a very wonderful way <coughs> and then ends in a very wonderful way as well, uh, bringing great encouragement to us. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40. Words of hope. Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them that they have suffered long enough and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them in full for all their sins. A voice cries out, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Fill every valley, level every mountain. The hills will become plain and the rough country will be made smooth. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. A voice cries out, Proclaim a message. What message shall I proclaim, I ask? Proclaim that all mankind are like grass. They no longer than wild flowers. Grass withers and flowers fade when the Lord sends the wind blowing over them. People are no more enduring than grass. Yes, grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God endures forever. Jerusalem, go up on a high mountain and proclaim the good news. Call out with a loud voice, Zion. Announce the good news. Speak out and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah that their God is coming. The Sovereign Lord is coming to rule with power, bringing with him the people he has rescued. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. Israel's incomparable God. Can anyone measure the ocean by handfuls or measure the sky with his hands? Can anyone hold the soil of the earth in a cup or weigh the mountains and the hills on scales? Can anyone tell the Lord what to do? Who can teach him or give him advice? With whom God does, does God consult? In order to know and understand and to learn how things should be done. The Lord, the nations are nothing. No more than a drop of water. The distant islands are as light as dust. All the animals in the forest of Lebanon are not enough for a sacrifice to our God. And its trees are too few to kindle the fire. The nations are nothing at all to him. To whom can God be compared? How can you describe what he is like? He is not like an idol that workmen make, that metal workers cover with gold and set in a base of silver. The man who cannot afford silver or gold chooses wood that will not rot. He finds a skillful craftsman to make an image that won't fall down. Do you not know? Were you not told long ago? Have you not heard how the world began? It was made by the one who sits on his throne above the earth and beyond the sky. The people below look as tiny as ants. He stretched out the sky like a curtain, like a tent in which to live. He brings down powerful rulers and reduces them to nothing. They are like young plants, just set out and barely rooted. When the Lord sends a wind, they dry up and blow away like straw. 
To whom can the holy God be compared? <clears throat> Is there anyone else like him? Look up at the sky. Who created the stars you see? The one who leads them out like an army. He knows how many they are and calls each one by name. His power is so great, not one of them is ever missing. Israel, why then do you complain that the Lord doesn't know your troubles or care if you suffer injustice? Don't you know, haven't you heard, the Lord is the everlasting God. He created all the world. He never grows tired or weary. No one understands his thoughts. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young grow weak. Young men can fall exhausted. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. Amen. And thanks be to God for this, his holy word. Thank you very much for the reading today. Uh, we're going to sing now from hymn number 473, My Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing this hymn to God's praise.
I'm sure every one of us has found ourselves at one time or another in a situation where we needed help. Uh, because we'd got to the stage in whatever situation we were in where we were out of our depth. Maybe something had gone wrong with our computer and we simply couldn't fix it. Or maybe we found ourselves in some other kind of situation where we simply couldn't actually deal with the situation ourselves because it was beyond us. And sometimes we reach a point uh, where we realize that we can't cope with a certain situation by ourselves and we need to ask someone else for help. Now the closing verses of the chapter which we read uh, this morning in Isaiah 40, they, they speak of recognizing our need of turning to God for strength. Uh, we can read uh, some of those verses again. We can read from verse 28. Don't you know, haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He created all the world. He never grows tired or weary. No one understands his thoughts. He strengthens those who are weak and tired. Even those who are young grow weak. Young men can fall exhausted. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not grow weak. And these, these verses, they teach us some very important lessons. Uh, they teach us important lessons about God and indeed about ourselves. They teach us about God's uh, unfailing strength. <clears throat> they also teach us about our own weakness, but wonderfully, they also teach us about God's strength in our weakness. So I want to think about those three things particularly. God's own unfailing strength, our weakness, or you might call that our failing strength, and you might, we want, I want us then to think about God's strength in our weakness. So as we read there in verse 28, we see uh, that God has unfailing strength. In the middle of the verse there we read, He never grows tired or weary. Now that's an amazing truth. It's a wonderful truth to, to, to grasp because God is without weakness. He is the one who created all things simply by His Word. He is the one who sustains all things, and His wisdom and His understanding are limitless. What a wonderful reminder for us of how great our God is. Now, the prophet's intention, the prophet Isaiah's intention in bringing these truths before the people to whom he was writing wasn't just to give them some kind of uh, list of things that were true about God. It wasn't so that they would have some bank of knowledge about God. He had a very practical reason why he was writing to them in this way. Uh, we read at the beginning of the chapter, we read this, Comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them they have suffered long enough. Isaiah was writing to people who had suffered. They'd gone through very difficult and challenging times. And so when Isaiah is telling them, this truth about God. He isn't just giving them a, a truth to store up in their truth bank. He's giving them something that relates directly to their lives. And sadly, all too often what happens with theological truths is that we simply pigeonhole them away somewhere we record them, but we don't really connect them with our lives. And, and when that connection between the truth of who God is 
and the connection between that truth and our lives is lost, then these truths become, in essence, meaningless for us, even though they have great meaning for us. We miss what it actually means. And God has revealed to us who He is and what He's like because He is a God who is involved with this world. And we see in the Scriptures that humanity as a whole uh, has come into a place where uh, rebellion against God is something that affects every single person. But nonetheless, we see that God still takes to do with such rebellious creatures as we are. And He takes to do with us in a way that he intervenes. We thought a little bit about that with the children, how uh, there, is a, there is a great message, there is good news that Jesus came into this world to save sinners, to save people who are affected by this rebellion, this almost innate rebellion against God. And so when we read this message and we see what Isaiah is saying as he is comforting a people who have tried to follow God and they've struggled in following God, we see something that's really, really important for each one of us to understand. And that is that we may struggle. We are weak in and of ourselves. We may try to live our lives in a certain way, and yet we may struggle to do so. We may struggle with matters of the faith. We may feel very weak when it comes to matters of faith in our lives. But God comes to us and He says that He never grows tired or weary. Maybe you've struggled in your faith. Maybe you've come along to church over years, but at the same time struggled. Or maybe you've been coming for a shorter time to church and you still struggle with your faith. You still struggle to lay hold of what God actually has for you. But these words come as words of encouragement, words that encourage us to lay hold of who He is. Because he is the one who comes and says, I will be your God and you will be my people. He says that to those who follow him, who put their faith in him. And he says here that he will be our strength when we are weak and when we struggle. God is so different from us. We fail, we falter, we tire, we grow weary, but He never does. And that should be a comfort to us, that we can rely on Him. Because even if we fail and falter, He never does. God's strength never fails. So when you're struggling, God is still all-powerful. He is the all-powerful one who delights to help those who ask Him for help. And that's an incredibly important point because so often we struggle to ask for help. I mean, I'm not talking just about spiritual things, but, you know, in our lives we come against situations and we think, I'll keep trying just to get through this. We try to struggle through at times when really we should have asked for help, asked someone to come alongside us who'd gone through the situation before, asked someone who knew a little bit more about it than we did. And if we'd just done that earlier on when we'd been struggling, we wouldn't have found ourselves in the situation that we ended up in where we were at our wit's end maybe. God is the one who offers to come alongside us. And in Jesus we see how He comes alongside us, taking humanity on Himself, 
going through the same kinds of experiences as we go through. Jesus was fully human, uh, is fully human and fully God. In his humanity, he, he experienced on this earth, he experienced every kind of thing that we can go through. So no matter what situation you face, no matter what temptation it is you face, no matter what struggle you have, Jesus understands what you're going through in a very personal way. He's not a far off savior who isn't interested in doing it, who doesn't have a personal experience to relate to you. He understands what you're going through. And he is ready to come and assist if you will but ask him. That's a wonderful truth to lay hold of. Because our God is a God who never tires, never grows weary. Our God is a God who is able to give strength to us in our weakness, who is able to be our strength. Those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. And then we read it in verse 30. We read these words, even those who are young grow weak. Young men can fall exhausted. I guess uh, in, 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 in youth, a person can feel almost invincible. And we know, of course, that's not true, but people can go through at least a portion of their life living as though that were true. And, you know, we can look at certain people and see in their lives that there's an incredible strength to them, whether it's physical or emotional or, 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 or mental strength. Uh, a, a while back, I, I saw a news article about a guy called Donny Campbell. He lives somewhere in Glasgow, I'm not sure where, but he lives somewhere in Glasgow, but he's got a connection to the Isle of Skye. And a few years back, uh, he did a run from Glasgow to Skye non-stop. <laughs> Who of you would like to try that kind of venture? <laughs> and just more recently, he, he ran up 24 Monroes inside 24 hours. He's an incredibly fit guy, very strong. He's re I'm not sure exactly how old he is, he's not terribly old. But you know, when he reached the end of that challenge of running up those 24 Monroes in 24 hours, even though he's so strong, do you know what he did when he crossed the finishing line? He collapsed. <laughs> he collapsed over the, over the finishing line, which is hardly a surprise. But you know, even though he's so fit and so strong, yet he can reach the end of his strength as well. And, you know, we can see people who have great stamina, uh, people who do amazing things, yet they always come to an end of their strength. So even the strongest human being will eventually reach the limits of their strength and their ability. Now, the Bible doesn't generally suggest that we compare ourselves with others, but when we do compare ourselves with others, we often find areas where we're much stronger or better than the other person and vice versa. But the Bible does again and again and again ask us to compare our strength with the strength of God. Not so that we'll come to the conclusion that, we, that our strength can in any way compare to the strength of God, but to see how far short we come of that. Our strength simply does not compare to the strength of God. I guess the problem with some people is that they don't have a proper understanding of who God is and what he's like, and they maybe think that they do compare favorably to him. But of course, when we read the scriptures, we see that that's simply not the case. And we need a realistic view, a biblical view of where we stand in relation to God. And our spiritual health depends on this. 
Because if you think that God is just like you, then you'll come to the com- conclusion that you compare quite well with him. You know, we, we read earlier in, in this chapter, we, we read about how some people would make idols for themselves uh, and how they, they worship these idols. But you know, what, what really was happening a lot of the time in, in terms of that kind of idol worship was that people were basically making gods that were a bit like themselves. Gods that weren't really that strong. Gods that weren't really able to do anything uh, a lot of the time. Or any of the time even. Uh, At least in terms of spiritual matters. Our comparison with the real, the living God is so different because we simply don't compare to him. And we need to let that truth sink in. Because when we realize how minuscule our strength is compared to his strength, and how kindly and lovingly he extends his hand towards us, offering to be our strength, that should just take hold of us and draw us to to him. It it should cause us to realize that we have a God who is amazing in his grace towards human beings. And to understand that he is the one who understands our weakness, but who helps us to understand our weakness and helps us to understand how we need him who can be our strength. Because he does give power to the faint, and to him who has no mighty increase his strength. He is the one uh, of whom we can say that those who trust him, those who trust in the Lord for help, will find their strength renewed. They will rise on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow weak. And this truth that's set before us, that God will be the strength of those who recognize their own weakness and to understand that he can be their strength, is an incredibly encouraging one. You know, maybe we might, some people might feel at times, well, I should be able to manage by myself. But you know, God created the whole world. He sustains us every moment of our lives. It really isn't something that we should be resistant to, to think that we need God's help. It it stands to reason that we need His strength. It stands to reason that we need Him to be involved in our lives. And if he isn't involved in our lives, then it makes sense that we would become weak and weary. I want to make just a little comparison, a a little story, a little word picture, as it were, of how crazy it is to think that, spiritually speaking, we can Go it alone without God. Think of astronauts. They go into their space vessel, whatever it is, a rocket. I don't have space shuttles working anymore these days. They go into the rocket, they go into the capsule. And what do they do next? Do they then stick their heads out and try to blow as hard as they can to get lift off? Of course not. That would be absolutely preposterous. (laughs) 
it would be preposterous to, to think that we could do that. But the Lord is able to lift us up to himself. And that is how we should live our lives, looking to him to be our strength. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are uh, the great almighty one. We thank you that you are able to answer prayer. We thank you that you are the one who has all strength. We pray for a friend who's unwell. Pray that you would uh, be her strength just now and that you would draw near to her. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a God of grace and of mercy. And we ask that you would grant us your presence and your blessing just now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to draw our service to a conclusion, singing from him uh, number 188. Well, before we do that, we'll have our collection, uh, and we're going to sing uh, whilst we're having the collection taken up. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways in which you provide for us. We thank you for your spiritual provision, and we thank you for the temporal provision that you grant to us. We thank you for uh, the way in which you provide for our needs, and we pray that as we give of what you have granted to us, that you would take it and that you would use it to uh, the good of others and to the glory of your name. And we pray that in this way that you might be honored in our midst. We thank you for this uh, opportunity, for this uh, way in which you enable us to serve you. And we pray also that you would grant us in our hearts uh, a passion and a longing to serve you in other ways as well. Uh, and that we might be able to honor you in all kinds of ways in our lives, serving others, uh, helping those who are in need, uh, helping those who are struggling. We pray that you would help us to, in this way, demonstrate in our lives uh, the love that you have shown to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Let's draw our service to a conclusion, singing from hymn number 188, uh, God is our strength and refuge, uh, based on the words of Psalm 46. Uh, it's also known as the Dam Busters hymn because it's set to the tune, or one of the tunes from uh, the Dam Busters movie. Uh, but it's a wonderful hymn reminding us of uh, God's uh, strength and the way in which he uh, ministers to the needs of those who find themselves needing his strength. God is our refuge, uh, God is our strength and refuge, our present help in trouble. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.